Well, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest we try and start this session so we, we keep the time at the end. Uh, this session is uh, a panel that will make a series of short presentations on the, uh, if you like, in the service of the Global Environment Space-based Contributions to GEOS. And GEOS, for those who don't know the acronym, is the Global Earth Observation System of Systems, which came out of the GEO, which is a group on Earth observations. Uh, initiated by the USA, I can't remember exactly how many years ago, but signed up to by some 80, 90 countries now, but I'm sure Jose could give us exact details on all of it. But we have five, five short presentations. as uh, Phil Majawa, who's the Director General, well, well he's a GEO co-chair, uh, and he's also the, um, I have to put my glasses on to read all the words, Director General of the South African Department of Science and Technology. And he will give a short overview presentation. We then have Stan Wilson, who's a, a senior scientist in the NOAA Satellite and Information Service. Yashushi Orikawa, who's the executive director of JAXA, and who has to leave us uh, about before the end of the session. So he will uh, answer one or two questions, then disappear quietly as we carry on with the, with the session. Gilberto Camara, who's the Director General of INPI in Brazil, and finally, José Shash, who is the Geo Secretariat Director and runs the uh, Group of Earth Observations, and he's trying to cajole everybody to contribute uh, to the, the GEOS concept. So I suggest we move on with the presentations. Um, Mr. Majawa will talk for about eight minutes or so, and then followed by the other speakers. I've then got a series of questions, and for the last 10 to 15 minutes, we'll ask for questions from the audience. And if you're going to speak from here, just to remind you, you can do, and we'll show you how to work it. If you wish to speak from the seat, you can do, but please say next slide if you want the slides to change. Otherwise, they'll just stay where they are. So, Mr. Majala. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to come and share um, what at the moment we are busy dealing with uh, in, within GEO, Group on Earth Observation. So we met in Cape Town where we had the ministerial summit and when we prepared for this ministerial summit we had to show the ministers that even though GEO is a young organization which is about three years old there's significant progress that's been made. And at that meeting, um, for most of you who were there, we reported on the progress and, uh, that has been done in GEO since uh, the last three years. We produced a document which uh, is called the full picture and also the first 100 steps to GEO's implementation. And both, of course, these last two documents are available on the GEO website. Now, most of you would know that in the last three years, we've really spent a lot of time trying to get GEO to be a functional organization. However, we believe now we are at a stage where we have to move um, from concept, the GEO's concept, into implementation. And this is something that I'm going to talk about in the next eight minutes or, or thereabout to try and elucidate to you what does this really mean. Of course, it means, number one, that um, we have to increase access to data, services, and products to meet the, the needs of the users. This has been said many, many times um, in this conference this morning, and some of the sessions I attended earlier on. It also means we need to build um, the technical and human resource capacity across the globe to produce and use Earth observations and of course it means we have to sustain our activities. And the last and important point is that the full implementation of a functioning GEOS, common infrastructure, and the continued engagement by the participating organizations and the countries that are members of GEO are essential to the implementation of GEOS. And what I heard in this slide is an attempt at the moment within GEO to have a web-based portal 
where members would begin to populate in this portal the activities that I think they are contributing to GEO. And then there would be a registration of components of the projects that people are involved with. And then, of course, there will also be a registration of the standards that have been used in populating that data. I will come back to this a little bit later on, uh, maybe during the discussions if the time allows. But we think that what this means is that we are now ready uh, to move from the concept uh, of GEO into an implementation program. Now, if, if we are very serious about getting GEOs um, to be a fully functional system, I'm afraid there are hurdles and the bumpy road ahead. And the first bumpy road that I think even in the previous plenary has been discussed, is this issue of data sharing principles. Now, we need full and open exchange of data, and of course, we have to do that recognizing the relevant international instruments and national policies. We need data and products at minimum time, delay, and minimum costs, and then we also need to look at the possibility of free of charge or minimal cost for research and education. Now, one of the things that the summit agreed last year was that we will work with the organizations like the ITU on making sure that there is a radio frequency protection, uh, which will make sure that there is long-term availability frequencies for terrestrial, oceanic, airborne, and space-based observations. We also committed ourselves, that is, the ministers as well, to work on these data sharing principles and see whether at the summit in 2010 we can present the consensus view on how this is going to be done. Now, to that effect, as you would know, um, the GEO Secretariat, uh, under the leadership of uh, Core Data, has produced a white paper on the data sharing principles, and I can elucidate later what is contained in this white paper. So we are appealing to you, the members, um, to participate in this process of uh, uh, interrogating this white paper on data sharing principles because we want to spend the next one and a half years or two years trying to agree on the framework that would govern how this uh, data sharing principle is going to work. Now, you probably see this slide as being empty, and uh, there's a reason why this is empty. We now have, together with the Science and Technology Committee and the GEO Secretariat, have agreed that if we then want to move from concept to implementation, we then need to look at the data and the contributions that we have within GEO at the moment to identify the gaps that we need in order to understand how the Earth system works. And at the last executive meeting, we spent a lot of time trying to conceptualize what exactly do we want to, to, to measure and what is it that we have uh, in the system in terms of the data that is available. And we have started a process of identifying the gaps that need to be filled in terms of the data that needs to be collected, both spaceborne and in situ. And we will, of course, be sharing this with the rest of the participating organizations and, and countries uh, in the next plenary, which is coming up soon. And once these gaps, of course, have been identified, we hope that uh, we would need to coordinate, expand, and maintain uh, the, the existing in situ and airborne networks and systems. We also would like to see a coordinated effort in the deployment of satellite constellations and the development, of course, of other instruments that are needed to fulfill the observational needs of all societal benefits. We will also have to take into account the new scientific methods and, and, and technologies in order to make sure that we fulfill the gaps that will be identified in the next revised 10-year plan. If, of course, we want to really create a global Earth observing system of system, it has to be a global endeavor. Now, this uh, the graph, uh, 
map of the world shows uh, the uh, members of GEO in green and in the participating organization, maybe it's not very, very clear on the screen, in, 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 in brown. And you can see that uh, there, there's still some gaps in terms of uh, members and participating, participating organizations. And it so happens that most of them are in Africa, number one, and in the developing world. So if we really want uh, GEOS to be a global endeavor, we will need to find a way of building capacity to bridge the gap between the developed world and the developing nations. And of course, to engage all countries as, as equal partners. We will also have to make sure that uh, we place uh, sufficient emphasis on building the human resource capacity, uh, as well as uh, facilitating coordination and collaboration so that we provide the, the infrastructure that would make sure that the decision making is made available to those that need it. And to this end, as you know, one of the committees of GEO is the capacity building uh, committee, and therefore it, its strategy will provide the much needed framework to guide efforts of various earth observation organizations, and then of course will help in facilitating, I think, the gaps that we will have identified. So the future directions, in short, is to really agree or develop this geodata uh, policy principles because, in our view, without it, uh, nobody is going to share the data or make the data available. Nobody will be able to distribute the data. So this is crucial going forward. Of course, with this uh, uh, geos common infrastructure that I've talked about, we hope to begin global earth observing system inventory of uh, the data and, and, and the range of in situ um, and, and, and satellite systems that are providing information to create uh, geos. And then we have to assess uh, the global observation gaps. We have to implement some operational tools like the geo portal, the geo netcast. And then we also need to demonstrate national, regional, and global earth observation programs in support of a number of societal benefit areas. And at the last plenary, uh, we already started to demonstrate some programs that have a regional flavor in trying to make sure that we move from national to regional and hopefully to a global earth observing system of system. We need to promote the use of earth observations in modeling data simulation efforts, explore ways to sustain successful research and development observations, and lastly, to engage both the academic and industrial partners. So, Chair, I think uh, that's where I'd like to, to, to end, and thank you for, for listening. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Mujawara. <coughs> then I would ask uh, Stan Wilson, the senior scientist in NOAA, to uh, give a short presentation from his perspective. Thank you, Chair. Let's now focus on the space-based components of uh, GEO. Next slide, please. CEOs, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, is a voluntary organization of 28 members and 28 associate agencies. As a space arm of GEOS, CEOs is working through its strategic implementation team, chaired by my boss, Mary Kiza, to implement the high priority actions to support various societal benefit areas that Josie will mention when he talks. And here are some specific examples of such high priority actions. Next, please. Generation of satellite products in support of the International Polar Year. We're generating both real time and historical products dating back to 1981 from the AVHRR. These include polar winds, cloud properties, snow cover, sea ice characteristics. The AVHRR is a workhorse instrument that has provided and it continues to provide to this day consistent indices of climate change in the polar regions that we've been experiencing for the past quarter century. Next slide, please. But there are many more instruments than the AVHR are flying in space today, and our challenge is how to integrate data from multiple sources. This is where the CO's Calibration Validation Working Group comes in. The CalVal Working Group is, is organizing the utilization of radiometric standard sites worldwide, Dome C in the Antarctic, Amazon Rainforest, 
the Saharan Desert, all in order to provide consistent targets for sensor calibration and, inter and intercomparison. This work is critical for the establishment of meaningful indices of long-term climate change, in effect taking sensor data records from various sources and integrating them into a global climate product. Next slide, please. But there are many different classes of, re of records. So CEOS has introduced the organizing principle of constellations, and we have a number of them. Atmospheric composition, which is focused on monitoring ozone and air quality, among other parameters. Land surface energy, map, excuse me, land surface imaging, forest mapping, ocean surface topography, which I'll mention in a subsequent slide. Precipitation, integrating active and passive microwave to monitor global rainfall. Ocean color, integrating observations of ocean color for forecasting harmful algal brooms and monitoring climate change. And ocean surface vector winds, providing sustained observations for high seas and tropical cyclone forecasting. Next slide. Finally, the ocean surface topography constellation, which utilizes satellite altimetry and precision orbit determination, is the only feasible way to measure global sea level rise. The current mean rate of global sea level rise is about three millimeters a year, almost twice that estimated from tide gauges over the previous century. Why is this important? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that global sea level rise will be anywhere from 30 to 80 centimeters over the coming century. And yet the actual measurements of global sea level rise from satellite altimetry and the ocean surface topography constellation is tracking the upper bound of the IPCC projections. I think we'll see at least a meter rise over the coming century why is this important? This is going to impact 146 million people worldwide who live within one meter of mean high water. That concludes my comments, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, thank you, Stan. And we'll move straight on so we have time for questions to uh, Ishushi Harakawa, who, uh, as I said, is the Executive Director of JAXA, and we'll make a short presentation. Thank you, Dave. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank for providing this very prestigious venue. Climate change is a fact, and human activities are very likely responsible. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to start my presentation by introducing JAXA's operating and planned satellites, which are all contributes to GeoGeo's activities. JAXA has been conducting its Earth observation programs focusing on climate change, including water cycle variation, global warming, and carbon cycle changes, and also mitigation and prevention of disasters. As you may know, the Advanced Land Observation Satellite, Daiichi, has three remote sensing instruments for precise land coverage observations. Daiichi is continuing its global observations and providing much valuable information, such as for land surface mapping and for disaster monitoring. These data are mainly collected through data relay satellite, Kodama. Kizuna and Kik-8 are telecommunication satellites. Kizuna is a wideband internet working engineering test and demonstration satellite and provides disaster information and images to Asia and Pacific region. Kiku 8 is to improve the mobile phone-based communication satellite and to contribute to the development of technology for satellite-based multimedia broadcasting system for mobile devices. This can also provide disaster information to the individuals in affected area. A greenhouse gas observation satellite known as GOSAT will help us understand global warming and the carbon cycle. Collaboration activities with NASA OCO are underway. GOSAT will be launched early next year. 
The global change observation mission, specifically GCOMW and GCOMC, will investigate climate changes, including water cycle variation. The global precipitation measurement, or GPM mission, as a follow-on mission to TRMM trim, is a joint cooperative mission between JAXA and NASA. ASCARE, which is also investigating climate change, including cloud dynamics, is a joint project with the European Space Agency. demos SAR and demos Optical are the next disaster monitoring missions, follow-on to DAICH, and, to, and seek to mitigate and prevent disasters. Next chart, please. In the past, G8 summit, next chart, please. The G8 Summit played key roles in promoting global observation and initiation of the GEOS. The G8 Toyako Summit in Japan agreed to accelerate efforts within GEOS, which builds on the work of UN specialized agencies and programs in priority area, inter area, climate change and water resource management by strengthening observation prediction and data sharing. It also supports capacity building for developing countries in Earth observations and promotes interoperability and linkage with other partners. This is a very significant agreement by the G8 summit leaders with considerable detailed direction on the way to accelerate the GEOS activities. The G8 Toyako summit also agreed on other activities for disaster risk management, reduction of greenhouse gas emission from deforestation and degradation, integrated water resource management, which are all relevant to the GEOS activities. Next slide, please. According to the G8 Toyak Summit Agreement on the acceleration of GEOS, Japan is ready to boost its related activities. Here I would like to show you six related Japanese activities which were presented at Geo Plenary in Cape Town last November. Global Monitoring Greenhouse Gas is a cooperative project among Japan, US, WMO, and related organizations using GOSAT of JAXA and OCO of NASA. NPO's GCOM Cooperation is cooperation on complementary missions between NPOs of NOAA and GCOM of JAXA. Sentinel Asia is disaster information sharing initiatives led by the Asian Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum to make the best use of Earth observation satellite data for disaster management in the Asia Pacific region. Asian Water Cycle Initiative is an integrated water resources management approach for addressing the various water-related issues, such as participated by national hydrological and meteorological department of 18 countries in Asia. Harimao is hydrometeorological ally for monsoon auto monitoring. It's planned radar and profiler observation network over Indonesia to provide data and to contribute to global climate change prediction. GeoGrid is aiming at providing an infrastructure to understand our Earth more insightful and more precisely and faster and easier to worldwide Earth science community. I hope that these initiatives will contribute to accelerate and strengthen GEOS. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Ishushi. And Gilberto, we'll move straight on because we are running a little bit late, but I don't want to take any time away from you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Could you please put the next slide, please? As you have seen, EP has been pushing for a vision of the future that will put forward that the discussions on the constellations on satellite and sensors that SEALS is posing as a space contribution to GEOS will provide free Earth observation data for all countries in the Earth. This is, of course, coherent with the policies of GEO, and we hope that all the satellites in the constellation, plus efforts such as important ones that have been put forward by other 
space agencies will provide free data to all countries in the Earth. Next one, please. Uh, this is a uh, discussion on nature. Nature, mega, nature, in very important scientific reviews, has stated that we need to increase the availability of data if we are to change our capacity of mapping the world. When the summit, G8 summit, introduced the idea of pushing for reduction of emissions from deforestation and degradation, the need for data became only the more uh, pressing. Next one, please. Therefore, we have announced in Cape Town the intention of Brazil and China to provide data from CBUS for Africa. We are now in the process, and I report to you, of establishing three ground stations, one in Egypt, one in the Canary Island, one in the South Africa, and these stations should be all operating until the end of this year. We are looking uh, strongly for partners for providing a station on the West Africa area where a very pressing need for data is there. We are also discussing how we extend the current CBUS coverage in Latin America to uh, one other ground station in Brazil, which will cover part of the Caribbean, and one other ground station in Mexico, which would cover Mexico and part of the United States. And we are actively pursuing the idea of extending that constellation of ground stations over to the Asia area, where then CBIS ground station would cover most of the Earth's landmass between 30 north and 30 south. And we hope that this idea will be taken by other countries and these other countries would also use either these ground stations or other ground stations as a means to provide data. And with data available, the next step is, of course, to invest heavily in developed observation systems for climate, for health, for all societal benefit areas of geos, where much work needs to be done and much work needs to be done in developing nations which concentrate a significant part of the populations at risk from climate change and at risk from other areas such as health, such as ecological problems, such as, as climate problems. So Brazil would hope that by adhering completely to the GEOS data policy, free and open data policy, we should open the way for other institutions and other space agencies to follow. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gilberto. I, uh, I recognize the theme from the previous session. Jose, you're not actually a contributor to the GEOS, no, but you have uh, quite a say in how it goes ahead, so perhaps well, uh, you I can was, give uh, your words. When, before we started, we were joking together, and I could say that my contribution could simply be uh, thank you, because uh, indeed uh, GEO is accepting contributions from members and participating organizations. We've seen a number of them. We've seen the GOSAT, ALOS, and other contributions. And CIOS is, uh, has been presenting contributions from all CIOS members. China and Brazil are contributing CBERS, and uh, there are many of them. But uh, actually, the whole thing is not that simple, because uh, GEOS is also about, essentially, about sharing. The key word is, is sharing. Actually, it started from the fact that we're sharing a number of problems and that the response to that should be that governments should be sharing their uh, observing and modeling capabilities and uh, that we should be sharing these capabilities between disciplines. And this is also an important dimension of, uh, of GEO which, and the GEOS, which needs to be emphasized. GEOS is an observing system which is not dedicated to one particular problem, however important, like climate change and adaptation. It's to be shared among all the disciplines and issues. So uh, to do that, we, uh, we engage in a number of, uh, of activities. Uh, and the first, the first, the main one is about architecture and access. Architecture and access means a number of things. It means a data policy, data sharing principle have to be implemented so that everybody has access to the information. And it means a common infrastructure, which are a number of registries where all these components are listed, uh, a clearing house to be able to browse through these, uh, um, these uh, registries. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
a main access point, which is the geoportal. And actually, for the time being, we're not developing one geoportal, but three, because as everything we're doing within Geo, we're accepting voluntary contributions from members and participating organizations. We have three volunteers to contribute a geoportal. We have one which is from ESA and FAO, Another one is, is uh, uh, contributed by CompuCell. A third one is, computed by, is contributed by ESRI. These are three geoportals which are currently under development and which will provide access to all the observations and derived information which has been presented by members. Next slide. Another area in which sharing has to be developed and uh, GEO is working is the integration of space and in situ. And I'm giving you here an example which is uh, much less known that uh, all the activities we're conducting in relation to uh, climate change. It's our biodiversity observation network that is being developed where space observations are uh, shared with in situ observations to try and build a global uh, observation network for looking at changes in, in biodiversity. Another dimension in this, uh, in this effort is the sharing and, uh, of experience between the users and the providers. Next slide. Uh, another good illustration of, uh, of uh, the kind of uh, sharing of resources that uh, GEO is trying to provide through GEOS is the, the effort uh, we are conducting to uh, see to what extent and to what accuracy space observations could be used for the monitoring of forest, forest degradation, forest conservation. Gilberto next to me is, is a world expert uh, on this issue and has had a lot of uh, dis public discussions on it. We're going to have precisely in Brazil, uh, in, in, in Iguazu, a, a big symposium where we're going to be uh, sharing the experience and analyzing the capabilities. We all know that by combining l our images from, from ALOS with C-band and X-band and combining this with uh, possibly airborne observations and situ observations, we may be able to uh, devise a, a monitoring, a forest monitoring system which uh, would have the required uh, um, accuracy to support the UN RED process which was announced by the Secretary General a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, and uh, this, this is also uh, uh, an interesting example where we're trying to bring together different satellites from different agencies to uh, uh, generate a single product. To conclude, I'd like to uh, 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 raise uh, three points. Number one, as uh, emphasized by Dr. Harikawa, that's on the next slide, the G8 summit uh, strengthened, it's uh, restated and strengthened its support to uh, GEOS implementation and engaged in accelerating efforts to, uh, to building uh, GEOS. That's a good indication of the political momentum which is behind GEO and the GEOS buildup, and that's, that's point number one. The point number two I'd like to make is that since we're talking about sharing resources, we should accept resources and contributions from everywhere. We've seen a, a, a series of examples of uh, contributions from governments and agencies. I think we should not neglect, and on the contrary, we should uh, in, engage more actively with the private sector and with industry. We've, uh, apparently there was yesterday, I wasn't here, but I've been told that Virgin made an announcement that it would be flying climate sensors on their, on their spaceship. This is probably going to be good publicity for Sir Richard and uh, very little data for climate, but it's a good indication. And in fact, an approach like the one that, uh, I guess the concept is the right one, and presumably what, uh, what is being investigated together with Iridium and Iridium Next, where we would have 66 low Earth orbit satellites with the possibility of carrying payloads, provides a lot more potential for Earth observation. This is another example. And there are other proposals uh, which have been made and the geosector has been approached by other players to do that. And the declaration from the Alliance of, uh, on Earth Observation, which was uh, released uh, early this week by my friend Nancy Colleton, is, is a good indication of the willingness and the potential contributions that industry could make to building GEOS. So that's the second point. 
And the third one is maybe a long-term vision to, 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 uh, to uh, trigger imagination. 20 years from now, what we should be doing is not just bringing together existing or developed systems or future systems which will be coordinated, but looking for an integration of our observing capabilities and possibly some international developments of observing capabilities. And we had a proposal a month ago in, in Japan by Dr. Harikawa. In, in, in January next year, GOSAT is going to be launched by Japan, which will be a first attempt at measuring um, carbon in the atmosphere. At the same time, NASA will be launching OCO. It's probably a good thing that we have two satellites measuring the same parameter at the same moment because the measurement is so challenging that having the possibility of intercalibration will be essential. But in a sense, it's also a waste of, uh, of uh, efforts because uh, there are so many gaps that launching two satellites for the same parameter at the same moment sounds like maybe not an optimum. And maybe the next generation, which will be even more challenging because it will involve flying LIDARs and several LIDARs in, in, in interferometric mode, may require a joint effort from NASA, JAXA, ESA, and all the other space agencies, possibly coordinated by CIOS and within GEOS. So my wish and my imagination is that uh, in the future, through GEOS, we'll be building uh, observing systems uh, as uh, truly international efforts. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jose. I think what, we, what, what we've done so far is hear uh, various views and overviews of what GEOS is and what the contributions might be. We're running a little late, so I plan to cut the number of questions to ask the panel to one question each and then try and take some from the audience because I'm conscious that we do have to finish on time to let people disappear to, to other sessions. <clears throat> so I understand the questions will appear on the screen, but the first one will go back to the opening speaker, Mr. Mijawar. Uh, and really, you, you gave a good overview of, of GEO, but have you talked with your fellow co-chairs about what you regard the next critical step shall we restrict it to, rather than steps? What do you and your colleagues think is the next critical step in, in, in the implementation of GEOS? Yeah, I hope this is, uh, we've talked about this uh, GEOS common infrastructure. It's probably going to be the most important uh, activity within uh, GEO in the next two to three years. If we want to create uh, an Earth observing system of system, a global one, we will therefore need to make sure that we populate this uh, GEOS common infrastructure with a set of activities that uh, participating organizations and member states uh, are doing. And then start to identify the gaps that are needed so that we can all plan, Jose has just talked about two satellites that will be launched doing the same thing. And maybe in future, in two or three years time after having identified the gaps, we'll be able to share as a community what boys should be deployed where which satellites uh, should be uh, constructed with various missions. So we think that once this uh, common infrastructure is up and running, we'll be really getting closer to uh, getting uh, an, op uh, an observing system of system. Now, of course, uh, this uh, GEOS common infrastructure is at uh, its uh, implementation phase now. The first, uh, what we call initial operating capability, uh, is now open for members to start populating, I think, their activities within this GEOS common infrastructure, and we invite the members and the participating organizations to go to our website and to start uh, playing around with, uh, with, with this. Uh, the second one is the one that we've talked about. Um, this white paper, uh, under the leadership of uh, Committee on Data for Science and Technology, called Data, uh, and on you know, the, the data sharing principle. Um, I really think that uh, this, in my view, is a deal breaker as we prepare for the next summit, and we do hope that uh, we will find a common ground that gives us, you know, a framework the, uh, within which uh, the international data sharing laws can be discussed, the principles, uh, and, and all other policies that are uh, impeding uh, in, the, in the data sharing principles. Now, one of the things that, again, uh, has happened uh, within uh, GEO 
is the folding of the IGOS partnership activities uh, within G. And we would like to make sure that there is a smooth transition of the activities of the IGOS uh, partnership within GEO, and we'll be working very, very hard to make sure that those activities are folded nicely uh, within GEO. And then I showed in the graph uh, the gaps in terms of uh, countries and participating uh, organizations in Africa. Uh, and we, in South Africa in particular, with other partners in Africa, would like to play a significant role in raising awareness about our contribution to the GEOs. And uh, South Africa, as uh, the member of, uh, as a co-chair of GEO, as well as uh, our role within uh, SADC, uh, as well as within the African Union, are playing a very, very important role working with some industrial partners to see whether we could not one, strengthen and accelerate uh, the idea of the African constellation of satellites uh, to uh, do all the observations that we need in Africa. So we are going to continue to champion those. And then the last point, of course, is that we've agreed to set up a, a, a set of performance indicators. And I think there was a meeting recently in, in Paris to look at uh, the terminology that we need to, to, to use so that we can have a set of measures that will make sure that as we implement the 10-year GEOS in, in implementation plan, we are able to monitor the progress. So those are probably the five key things that I think, uh, who, as co-chairs, we would like to see going forward in the next two years. Okay, well, <clears throat> the next question will come up, but I'm going to ignore it because uh, our colleague, Hishushi Harikawa, has got to disappear in a moment. So I'll ask him the question we were going to ask him, which is, uh, Within, within Japan, what, what plans and ambitions do you have to ensure the timely dissemination of data to Earth observation community from the satellites you have? Thank you, Dave. Uh, first of all, uh, I was supposed to leave earlier from this session, but I just got uh, information my flight schedule is delayed. So I will <laughs> be here until the end of this session. <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, uh, the uh, data which was received from uh, our Earth observation satellite uh, should be disseminated to the uh, users or researchers as early as possible. So in that sense, JAXA, uh, not only uh, in Japan, Japanese uh, ground station, but also we are uh, contacting with uh, foreign ground stations like uh, uh, which has a high latitude uh, ground station, like Norway, Svalbard, or uh, Swedish uh, Kiruna station. And uh, those data will be transmitted uh, through the online channel. And, and also we have the capability to transmit the data relay satellite to use uh, such media. So uh, once we get those data in Japan, uh, we uh, process, uh, for example, level zero, level one processing, and then if those data is uh, necessary uh, for uh, immediate, you know, dissemination like uh, weather satellite data, uh, such a thing, uh, we are aiming to uh, disseminate those data within uh, three hours uh, and as quick as possible. And those data can be downloaded through website uh, by users or researchers. So those kind of uh, systematic approach uh, it will be necessary and we are planning to do so. And also, for example, disaster monitoring satellite, uh, we emergent uh, you know, observation will be planned for those satellites. Okay, well, thank you, Shishi. I'm sorry your flight's delayed, but it yet again proves that every cloud has a silver lining, and <laughs> here you are with us. We, we'll move on to a question for Jose, uh, which is uh, the, the G8 group of industrialized nations meeting in, in Japan this year agreed to accelerate the process of GEOS, which we all may assume means they will put more money into developing systems and services. As, as the Secretary Director of GEO, what, what do you think GEO is doing to try and facilitate that process to follow up from that statement, which is quite a powerful statement? I guess I gave a, I gave a few examples in, in my talk, so I can be pretty brief. 
you look at the G8 declaration, it talks about accelerating GRs for climate change, for water resource management, as to building and develop interoperability. And uh, so, um, uh, as, as I said, interoperability and integration of system is the core of our activity. Phil Moir has, uh, has uh, further emphasized this. This GEOS common infrastructure with the registries and the clearing houses is, is an absolutely essential feature. And, and again, I'm echoing the, uh, the, 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 the call of my uh, GEO co-chair. Uh, it is very important that the members of GEO and the participating organizations do contribute, do populate the registries so that we can actually efficiently use this browser and this clearing house. So uh, that's absolutely essential, but all the infrastructure is in place. On climate change and adaptation, this, this effort on forest monitoring from space is a clear response to uh, one of the adaptation mechanisms which is likely to be uh, put in place. I didn't mention water management, but we are also dedicating significant efforts to uh, developing a global uh, um, observation system for water, which, which combines two things. One is the upgrade or the restoration of in, in situ observation system for water, because they're falling apart in a very bad condition. And the second is that there's a, an enormous potential for space observations for water management, whether through altimetry uh, over lakes and, and rivers, uh, uh, soil moisture, even gravity now we know is contributing. We haven't worked out yet the models to integrate all these observations together and with in situ. So we are working in this direction to respond to water management adaptation to this issue. And uh, capacity building is another element of the GA declaration on which, uh, I mean, Phil Moira has presented a number of activities. So, yes, we, uh, we have a number of actions ongoing. To okay, well, we've got uh, two more questions before we ask the audience, and I'm looking with bated breath to which one comes up because I've got a different running order. For, for Stan, it's for Sam Wilson, for, for you, it's to ask you what you think are the challenges that are facing us in, in space agencies partnering and working together to advance GEOS? What, what are, for you, the key challenges that you see? I think we've got uh, three challenges. One is funding. No one nation can afford to do it all. And uh, the CEOs constellations provide a mechanism to establish partnerships to secure the necessary funding, both to implement systems to maintain continuity, and fill gaps. So funding is one. Two is the recurrent theme that I believe everybody has talked about, and that is data policy. And as a specific example, uh, for operational users in sharing data, they typically need data within three hours. And if they can't have that, then the operational forecasters cannot derive benefit. And third is uh, data utilization. Is our challenge is how to get consistent products into the hands, particularly of new users, in a form that they can easily use, and most importantly, that they know what to do with them. Okay, well, thank you for being brief and, and, and clear. Uh, and the last question goes to uh, Gilberto. And really, it's a question which, which has been touched on before, but how do you see developing countries probably those that really don't have space hardware participating in the, in the GEO and the GEOS process. Okay, uh, I think what we've seen now is a very uh, positive interest in developing countries in space and the fact that they have this interest has translated into a number of initiatives by uh, either building or buying satellites. What we feel that part of this effort is motivated by the lack of data over their countries. Now, Brazil's experience and the experience of these countries, uh, of our countries uh, who have been successful in Earth observation, uh, shows clearly that research and applications should come before satellites. Brazil used Landsat for 30 years before launching its own observation satellites. And the key to our success for monitoring deforestation is that we relied on other people's satellites, in this case Landsat, to develop our capabilities. 
So my point currently, if we have an open data policy, and if developing nations would be sure that data is available to them, they could divert the money which is currently being put into building satellites, into building their own research and applications capacity. We are at the critical situation where each country I talk to is, is buying a new satellite. They will be swamped with data, but not enough money being put in research and applications. So my guess is, please forget about b building satellites before you have a strong research and applications community. Okay, well, th thank you to you all. I think we can now find a, a short period of time to ask questions from the floor. And I think we have one up there. And if, when you get the microphone, you can introduce yourself first because uh, it's very difficult to see from up here. Uh, my name is Christian Lenz with Geo Optics. And I was wondering if you can further elaborate on the role of, uh, that industry can play in the collection and processing and distribution of such data. Who would like to... Uh, have a go at answering that one. I guess, Jose, you may be the default as the Secretary oh, General. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, elaborate uh, would be uh, it's probably the, not the right place to, to, to do it because it would be a long story. I think it, a lot to do, uh, has to do with uh, negotiating, educating, and, and discussing because uh, um, industry can contribute by building satellite if they, if they are paid for it. <coughs> now, how can they contribute to the, to the benefits of, of, of both? Uh, probably by uh, developing mechanisms through which they can, they can generate revenues which would all at the same time provide beneficial information. So it's a pretty long story. And um, uh, I think the, the first step to go would be to engage with industry in a dialogue to see uh, where, how, to the benefit of both, we could actually uh, see a contribution. Let me, let me if I but may, give a straightforward discussion. Uh, that, that my answer is don't. Forget about commercial policies, data policies, if we want to have a good Earth observation system to the benefit of humanity. Industry should be engaged in providing data paid for by the government, but should not engage itself. And it has, industry has proven a failure in providing applications. All the attempts that we have seen from industry to provide applications from the satellites have failed. There's no single attempt which has been successful. Industry should forget about making commercial use of Earth observation data and should engage itself in building the best satellites we can. Simple as that. Okay, well, perhaps we've got time for one more question I see from down at the front. Yeah, hello. I'm uh, Rahul Suresh, a uh, student from India. And my question is this. Uh, we all know that uh, environmental conservation will never be successful until carried out on a global level. And uh, several developed countries have a lot of uh, Earth observation satellites well developed. But is there an international framework to make sure that there is free flow of process data into the countries which do not have space programs so that they also can implement it at a grassroots level? Exactly what GEO does. That's exactly why GEO was created, and that's why we are working so hard on this data policy. And, uh, it's the response. Anybody want to add to those very brief words? Okay. Well, I think um, we've got to let people move on. It's, we've run out of our time slot. So I'd just like everybody to thank the, uh, the panelists for their presentations and their answers <laughs> to the questions. And thank you for staying with us.